All right. Howdy. Um, I'm Matt Mason. I'm the Nebraska State Poets, um, which is kind of a, a lifetime achievement award for poetry or something like that. Um, but I, it's a five year term and I'm trying to get all around the state. And those have been interrupted for the past couple of years uh, by this very rude condition. But uh, glad to be getting out a little bit. Um, we're going to do some poetry writing. And while we do, feel free to get up, go get more pizza, get more iced tea, whatever you want. Uh, walk around the room. All good. Whatever your writing needs, that's OK. Um, I'm going to start just with a poem that I like. And you, you might have seen it before, you might not have. It's called The Summer Day by Mary Oliver. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean. The one who has flung herself out of the grass. The one who is eating sugar out of my hand. Who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I've been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? It's just Mary Oliver. Just like that poem, it's just, uh, just tells a story. It's just about, I was out walking and this grasshopper jumped on me and I wrote a poem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think sometimes we're taught that po poems are supposed to be more. It's like, no, what's really going on? No, she was out walking and a grasshopper jumped on her. She had these kind of, you know, metaphysical thoughts, but you don't have to go into that. It's all good. Um, you know, you're just right. So that's kind of what we're going to do. I'm going to have everybody do a little bit of writing. Um, I've got a couple exercises. Hopefully we'll get through both of them. Um, but I love, uh, does everybody have something to write with and something to write on? Does anybody need something to write with? Uh -oh. I can grab that pen. All right. <laughs> Fortunately, we have an whole English department. <laughs> we have pens and papers. Better than just this little pad of sticky notes. Ted Kuzer, who's a Nebraska poet. Woo. Um, 
So after years. Today, from a distance, I saw you walking away. And without a sound, the glittering face of a glacier slid into the sea. An ancient oak fell in the Cumberlands, holding only a handful of leaves. And an old woman scattering corn to her chickens looked up for an instant, at the other side of the galaxy, a star 35 times the size of our own sun exploded and vanished, leaving a small green spot on the astronomer's retina as he stood on the great open dome of my heart with no one to tell. What's that poem about? What do you get from that poem? I'm just kind of, I mean, I can rattle on, but what's that poem about? Go simple. Don't go complex. What happens? It's about nature. There's nature. There's a whole lot of nature going on. It's called After Years. What is that? Death. Could be. There could be some death. Seeing something familiar. Yeah, seeing someone familiar. Um, I just kind of like that. So it's called After Years, and it starts... Today, from a distance, I saw you walking away. And then it's like, boom, all of this stuff goes crazy. Glaciers fall, trees fall. And the next thing you know, you're on the other side of the galaxy wondering, how the, what is going on? And then it's like, boom, zips back into his own heart. And it's like, it's kind of cool. It's just a way of, you know, at the very beginning, that very beginning grounds you, hopefully. You know, it tells you, after, you know, after years today from a distance, I saw you. Doesn't explain who this person is. Doesn't say um, what their meaning was, but you get there was something big, um, like an old lover or an old boss that they really hated or a family member who they are not allowed to talk or who knows what the story is. But the story is not important. It's all about the feeling of just this uh, thing that's like, you know, have you ever had that where you look up and you see a site and also it's like, bam, you're on the other side of the universe and then zing, like rubber banded back. Um, it's just kind of an exciting feeling. And that's all it is. I mean, it's a little bit complicated. It's like that first time I read it, it's like, what's going on? So I got to read it a couple of times and it's like, all right. And I'm sure there's even more going on underneath, but I don't care. Or read as far. I mean, that's why I like poems by someone like Robert Frost. Because you read those once, you get a story. It's like, all right, I get a story. Put it away. If you want, you can read it a second, third, or 105th time, and you'll get different layers. But you don't have to. You can read it just that once. Get that little bit. Um, have conversation. Have arguments with friends that, uh, you know, when you took that other path in the wood in the yellowing woods that it's really a poem about despair and failure not this thing who knows there are different layers it's all there somewhere so with that here's a quote uh from a nebraska poet named bill clefcourt he was a nebraska poet uh state poet for a long time he passed away a few years back though uh, but he defined a poem as a poem is an attitude looking for something solid to sit on. I just like that. Uh, you know, a poem is an attitude. Sometimes we say poems are full of feelings or emotion. And I like that he doesn't go there. He goes attitude. Um, but then he says looking for something solid to sit on. Because an attitude, a feeling, an emotion... That's not solid. That's something that could be defined a million different ways. But you find it something solid to sit on, you find it a way to define it. Um, like, you know, if I say the word sad, everyone's going to define it differently depending where you are in this day. Like, you know, you're like, yeah, I'm kind of sad because that pizza made me feel a little sick. And you're like, yeah, I'm sad because my grandmother was kidnapped by Al Qaeda. Um, <laughs> sad works for both of these, but they're not the same. 
Um, emotional words, emotional language, attitudes, feelings can me can have as many meanings as there are, you know, inches in this room. Um, a good poem, what it tries to do is find the right way to say it so that someone else doesn't just kind of get an emotional, okay, that person is sad, but they feel the right kind of sadness from it. Um, so I, I love that definition of poem. A poem is an attitude looking for something solid to sit on. Um, let's see, note here. Yeah, it's like a poem is a wisp that needs something behind it. It needs a background to be visible. Um, so what we're going to do is first, we're not going to write a poem yet. We're just going to write a few lists. Have you done poems this way? Uh, sometimes I like starting a poem with lists because it, it just gets you, it gets you thinking on certain ways. And then it gives you a bunch of things that when we get to the point where I say, now write a poem. And you're like, Ooh, you've got a bunch of things you can put in. So the list, what are three items in your house that you use every day, but you don't pay much attention to? So not something important. I'm not talking your car, I'm talking maybe, hey, maybe your toothbrush, but that's kind of important. Maybe a piece of floss, but what are three things in your house or your apartments or in your van, wherever you hang out? And just small things. Small things that have a certain amount of importance though. And then, What, for your second list, you may not be done with the first, but you better hurry or you fail my class. <laughs> um, it should be horrifying. Uh, no, it won't. Uh, what are three things or scenes that have played out for you over the last month that you never want to do again? Three things. This could be... <laughs> something as small as cleaning the toilets to something as large as dealing with a serious family problem to a breakup, to an argument, to a recipe where you cooked bread and forgot to put salt in it and it just tastes like the <laughs> faked version of water. I don't know. Three things you never want over from the like the past month ish. You can go a little further if you need to. You can cheat in my class. You can also lie. You can make things up. This is creative writing. Poetry is truth, but it does not need to be factual. So you got three items and three scenes or something. And now, what are three positive? things that have happened to you over the past month. Could be very small, it could be something, a gift, could be something you did, could be you baked a loaf of bread, you put the salt in and it tasted fantastic, the best ever. <laughs> but just three small things that you consider positive from about the last month. You came to a poetry thing and somebody gave you pizza. So you have approximately three items, maybe three things you never want to see or do again, three positives. What are three events from this past month that you think should be historical? And how you define historical is up to you. That could be national history, world history, your history, you know, in the, in fact, at least one of them should be your history. You know, in 20 years, when they're looking back at the newspapers, what over the last month is the story of the magnificent thing you did? No matter how small. What are three historical things from around the last month? 
things that could be considered historical, even if that's a stretch. All right. So in an old poetry book called Lyrical Ballads, uh, William Wordsworth and um, Samuel Taylor Coleridge defined poetry. I give Coleridge more credit because sometimes I don't like Wordsworth. Uh, the Wordsworth probably wrote this, but I'm still going to give Coleridge credit. But he defined poetry saying, poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. It takes its origin from emotion recollected in tranquility. I like that. It's the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. So you get this, you know, this moment where you get these powerful feelings in you. And then you don't write it down there. You got to wait till the tranquility. And then you write it down. So this is our moment of tranquility. List three emotions or emotional moments from the past month or so. And you may have covered this in some other ones, but it's okay. You can redo them, add new ones. And when we say powerful emotions, sometimes all that's as simple as doing a double take because you saw something beautiful at your window. Hey, anything that makes you physically respond to it is somewhat of a powerful emotion. I would say a little bit of each. Yeah. Thank you. Good clarification. Like the list the emotion and then a couple details to qualify it. And while you're writing that and going back and doing other things, I'm going to read two poems. This is a poem by Wendell Berry called The Peace of Wild Things. When despair for the world grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. For a time I rest in the grace of the world and am free. So when he gets stressed out, he just goes out into nature. But he says it nicely. Yeah. It's Wendell Berry, The Peace of Wild Things. Yeah. And then this poem, which is kind of similar, is by a poet named Gary Snyder. It's called, We Make Our Vows Together with All Beings. Uh, and it mentioned in the word, it mentions Beale, which is an Air Force base in the West. So we make our vows together with all beings. Eating a sandwich at work in the woods, as a doe nibbles butt brush in snow, watching each other chewing together. A bomber from Beale over the clouds fills the sky with a roar. She lifts her head, listens, waits till the sound is gone by. So do I. So, nice poem. Nothing too complicated. He's, work, he's at work in the woods. He did forestry work and stuff. He feels this connection between a deer, sees a bomber. They both kind of look at it the same. It's like nothing too complicated. So it's just that moment of share. That's kind of a the emotion he feels, you know, this connection with the deer is kind of cool. So I think he might write that down as a moment of powerful emotion. All right. So go back to your, look at your lists again and maybe add an item to any of the lists. Maybe two, if something's come to you. And while you do that, I'll read one more poem. This is a poem of mine. It's called Notes from the Pandemic Office. I take an office chair into the woods, get some work done. I don't need a motivational poster tacked to a cubicle's wall because the wall is a tree. 
It clicks and hushes as wind rocks it motivationally. To be honest, I'm not getting much work done. These cardinals are loud co-workers. Squirrels have no boundaries. Trees drip yellow leaves on me. And that raccoon keeps staring. It's creeping me out, man. But I've been inside for so long, sitting in the same place on the red couch, email, spreadsheets, yelling instructions to my kids watch TV, eat dinner. I haven't started my car in a week. <clears throat> We've been locked down while my congressman runs endless ads on TV about everything he's done for health care, which I'm fascinated by as it always has seemed like he wants me to die. <laughs> and I guess given the circumstances, he's kind of closing in. So well played, congressman. Damn it, I came to the woods to get away from that, from the hum of interstate to cricket wing, jay screech, leaf brush, seated somewhere new, here to change my view. All right. Now look at your lists and write a poem that might be brilliant or terrible. Possible opening lines for you in the middle of January, in the middle of a pandemic, or the history of yesterday, these are all possible opening lines or titles. You can ignore them or choose one, but take things, you don't have to use every item from your list. Take the ones that kind of speak to you and just write and see what happens. If anybody needs me, I'm gonna get more iced tea. Oh, let's say 10 minutes. I'll set a, set a timer. Don't worry if it's brilliant. Just try to write something that's interesting to you and you alone. The rest of the world doesn't need to see it. But maybe they will. Write something brilliant. Yes. <laughs> you passed my class. <laughs> About a minute and a half left. You don't have to finish. Get as far as you can. So what you have now, who knows what it is. It might be brilliant. It might be terrible. You might think it's brilliant, and then you read it in a month and realize it's terrible. It might be look something you look at right now and think it's terrible and then you look at it in a month and think it's brilliant poems are weird like that um but you've got a first draft which could be kind of anything um i write everything by hand for all new poems um i don't know if you can see but here's a poem i wrote and it's x'd out and there's half the words are crossed off there's things over here with like the letter A circled in a word. That means when you come to the A circled with a word, you take this and it's a complete mess. And then it's rewritten on the next pages. So, I mean, your initial draft might look nothing like what it might look like in the future. Who knows? So don't worry too much, but is, does somebody have something you want to read? Um, either a line a couple words or the whole poem. Who's got something you might want to share? A description of what you're writing. Awesome. Thank you. Right, read as loud as you can so people can hear you. You can come up front if you want. You can turn around. You can do whatever you want. Oh, I'll, 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 I'll stay in your house, right? That's what I'm here. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and tell us, what's your name? Um, so I go by Kai. All right. Thank you, Kai, for volunteering. Um, in the middle of January, I sit impatiently, waiting, hoping the answer calls to me, gender. The urge of masculinity to open the pickle jar and be told how handsome I am. 
the freedom of femininity to not wear pants and feel a summer breeze, to be gentle and caring. I ponder this word every second from the beat of my home to the door of counseling. Why me, I cry. The beat of fear slowly dies as I open my eyes to the world of non binary Thank you for sharing. Oh. My monster. <laughs> <laughs> and good details. I like you kind of start with the positives and either way you look at it and kind of dive into your own personal kind of feeling. That's awesome. Way to bring it alive. Who well, else? Anybody else? All right. And what is your name? Aiden. Aiden. <laughs> Pretty good, but I'll stand anyway. That's good. He'll probably help. The morning starts with thumping hearts, a body revving from slumber. And though the warm covers entice, you know you, you can't go back under. But a world exists in linen, and the comforter feels so nice. Just 10 more minutes. Then 10 more minutes. <laughs> and the pillow is pulled by your snores. <laughs> nice. nice. I like the kind of the kind of lazy rhyme of just kind of letting it ride and hooking the sections together, and just really it's well paced, which it has to be for a poem like that. Nice. Who else? And what is your name? Luke. Luke. It lies within the bowels of a home, used but once a day, every day. Rumpled and wrinkled, it lies alone, furry wings splayed wide, a round mark upon its hide. A neat cocoon its wings do make, when furled in at night, sealing warmth within it tight. Upon the morn when the sun begins to rise, the wings unfurl, leaving in their wake, me, blanket cast aside. <laughs> We might have a theme going. <laughs> There's a good theme. I totally, I totally approve of that. Getting out of bed is difficult. <laughs> nice. I like the the. I mean, there's some good creativity think, with the kind of the metaphor of cocoon and wings and all. Very well put together. All right. I know there were other hands. Um, all right. And what is your name? Gavin Sloan. Gavin. All right. The midnight breeze, howling, screeching at me, pushing against my body as I try to run. Harder and harder, I try to break the wind, but to no prevail. The wind pushes harder, screeching louder and louder. Then a foreign sound, a strange sound is heard. I close my eyes tightly, then open them again. I realize it was only a dream, and the strange sound, only my alarm clock. I roll over to, to, to turn it off, and I go back to sleep. <laughs> Definite theme. <laughs> I like it. I like the description of the dream and then the, the break from that. Well done. All right, who else? All right. And what is your name? Denise. Denise. Right. It's January. Endless pandemic. Disconnected from the trauma of the world. Masks mean no more lipstick. Now that we're pretending COVID doesn't exist, I can wear that perfect shade of black again. My feet are still in slippers. In January, all is not well. A child is lost. The community grieves. Newlyweds become widows. Teenagers still hate their parents. In January. That's good. It's I love the choppiness of it because it really fits what you're talking about of just like the bleakness. So just short statements, and then putting in details, just like the, the feet and slippers, and, uh, the bit about the lipstick and all. I mean, those are just good little details. That so that I mean, details are so important to a poem. You find the right details, and it'll stick in someone's head. You don't find the right details, and it just slips off, and they forget it. But 
Um, so good job. Who else? All right. And what is your name? Brandy Lou. All right. Thank you, Brandy Lou. My mornings begin with an immediate recharge from previous nights of exhaustion. Years drowned in heavy rhythms of bass. Army is swinging to and fro from my sound of mind. My spirit is ignited. And with every staccato drum beat comes a gear shift of energy. An inner motherboard flashing with activity as music flows through each circuit path of my body. Right. Really good energy and description there. Good, good use of words, putting in the musical words, staccato and other things. Nice. Yeah, All right. Okay. <laughs> and what is your name, ma'am? I'm Brenda. <laughs> Not to be confused with the beautiful and talented Brenda Lynn. <laughs> There's an actual folk. Okay, here we are. In the middle of January, told I was influential, grocery prices rising, stepping in warm chicken food, frustrated from lack of attention. Pay attention to me now. COVID ending, I watched spoon my contact case in front of door. Worry for my loved ones, not the beans, for the history we're creating now from this place, and feel love and chaotic truth like man goes swirling sunflowers. I really love the hailstorm of fragments at the beginning. It's just like, yeah. and then it's like, wait, what was the chicken poop? And then they're gone. <laughs> You're a mile past that by the time you get the thought out, um, <laughs> which is really effective for what you're talking about. That's awesome. Anybody else? Well, Brenda's going to go. <laughs> yeah. well, in the middle row, I experienced the history of yesterday. It sits next to the stable under the cold window shade, balanced like a teaspoon on the edge of a coffee cup. In the middle of yesterday, I remember the death of my uncle, and that long flight of the broken seat, tedious like driving across Wyoming in the dark. In the middle of light snowfall, I frisbee with the dogs. They race and jump and slide into place. I like teaching. It doesn't matter if it's these buckets for my students. <laughs> and so I find myself in the middle of the clouds on that international flight home. After all these days of clenched fists and short breaths, and I'm stuck here in the middle of my memory, in the middle of yesterday, stuck, still thinking, but stuck inside my memory. That's so well done. I mean, I love how you were, I mean, the details there are so good in bringing us not, so, we're not just seeing it from a distance, it's like we're standing next to you as this stuff goes on. So throwing the frisbee, and then the one that you recur, the recurring bit of the plane trip, the the death. Um, that's that's really powerfully put together, and it's all grounded with that. You know, the history of yesterday. It's under the stapler on the windowsill. It's like really good details. That's that's what I love in a poem. Um, I think we're. When we, when we start writing poems, often we're a little vague because we know exactly what we're saying, you know? And sometimes it doesn't always translate it onto the page. And so we write the most brilliant poem ever, but nobody else gets what we get from it. Um, details really help others get the same poem that you wrote. Because um, I think all, like the first hundred poems I wrote are brilliant, you know? to me. <laughs> um, so it's figuring out the details are kind of like the doorknobs into a poem um, so that somebody else can get into them. So, okay. Anybody else? Yes. All right. Mine is like pretty long, so sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> Never apologize. Okay. Well, I'm not sorry. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> All right. This blanket smells like ploy air freshener. The scent of the litter box clinging to the paws of the great white cat who hasn't learned how to appropriately wipe his feet after his morning routine. Sometimes he chooses to be in there at the same time as me, him sneezing in succession while I brush my teeth. He may be allergic to the litter, but he's too used to it to consider a change. Other times, he brushes against my legs while I use the human litter box, staring up adoringly and protecting me from the predators who would no doubt leap from behind closed doors to attack me in, the mo in my moment of vulnerability. Then he demands payment for his service, gazing doe-eyed 
from the bathtub until I turn on the tap so he can drink the crystal clear waters that are so much purer than that in his bowl. I don't have the heart to tell him all the water comes from the same source. After this routine, I'll grab a blanket from the cedar chest and lie on the couch to read or watch TV or solve crossword puzzles. He'll wait patiently to the side, waiting for me to make his camp, to make a hammock between my legs, then I'll circle a few dozen packs, searching for the predators that spared us in the bathroom while he feels until he feels satisfied with our safety. Only then does he use my leg as a pillow, snuggling into his safe space. Who knows how long he'd stay here if I never had to leave? Minutes, hours, days, until our neighbors come home and play loud music? But here, the cinnamon roll rests, his paws over his eyes to keep out the sun. Back paws curled into a ball, satisfying circle cat. I suppose I could just wash the blankets more often, purge them of that letter box and few lines smell, but it'll only return in a few days after a few cuddle sessions. After all, we don't keep pet cats because they're courteous. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and again, good details. And I, I've heard that, and I think it works, that smell details can really pull you into some writing. So way to start with the litter box. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's fun and good description throughout. And I just like the one where you just like call them a cinnamon roll and don't go into description why. We don't need description why, um, but sometimes we still do uh, put that down. So that was just a nice little, little description of the scene, the curled up cat and great ending. So. Anyone else? Yeah, well, this is good. I, I, like, I like these poems. Um, what I always say about poems is don't write poems that you think poetry is supposed to be. Write the poems that you wish poetry had more about. You know, write the poems about your life or what's interesting to you. Um, I once taught a composition class and it wasn't poetry, but there was a student who, uh, you know, was turning in these very technical essays. And it's like, dude, yeah, these are okay. Uh, but what are you really interested in? Um, he's like, uh, and he's a comic book nerd. And just like, I mean, I just, you, you know, you get him talking outside of the subjects in class and he would talk about Spider-Man forever. Um, it's like, write, a, write an essay about Spider-Man. And he wouldn't. <laughs> um, it's like he'd been trained in high school that you cannot write essays about Spider-Man. That is not what you do in English class. <laughs> and finally I broke him down and his last essay was about Spider-Man and it was an A essay. Um, and that's what with poetry. I think sometimes we think, oh, a poem is supposed to do whatever. Uh, poem does whatever you think it should do. Um, so if you're thinking, gosh, I wish poetry did more of this, then you can do it. Um, and I hope you will. And that's why I just, you know, I like hearing poems about alarm clocks and uh, figuring out the world in relation to who we are inside in reality or our cat or Spider-Man or anything like that. Um, so good job. I mean, sometimes I go in and teach workshops and the results are good, but not as good as this. So uh, this was a lot of fun. So. Do one more. We have less time. We'll do one more bit of writing. I'm gonna read you a poem. Oh yeah, does anybody need more paper or do your pencil break? We'll get you hooked up if you need more. All right. This is a poem of mine. It's called Eight Beautiful Things About This Last Year. It was wrote, written uh, not quite a year ago, but a year into the pandemic. So eight beautiful things about this last year. The way you used your car so little, the battery became a stone that couldn't spark even a speck in the overhead when you opened the door. Couldn't make so much as a click when you went to unlock the other doors with the switch. 
the way you woke up at 5 a.m. most mornings, fully awake, hoping there was good news. The way when the tree fell, you cut a picnic area from the emptiness it cleared in your yard, placed trunks in the widest logs and the widest logs as stools, set yourself there on summer afternoons with a notebook and a cup of tea. The way cauliflower is so surprising. <laughs> the way the dog smiles, the way he moves room to room in the day, to Sophia in algebra class, to Lucia in social studies, you in a flurry of emails and spreadsheets at the kitchen table, your wife wrapping up teaching composition to 17 black squares on a computer screen. You, ma'am, he says knowingly, need to get outside, take a walk. The way of these cookies, the recipe that Lucia has been working to get perfect. The way there is at last a truce between days, where Monday is essentially just one more Thursday, Sunday another sort of Wednesday, the autonomy of Tuesday's declaration that it is whatever it wishes to be. The way of everything you never imagined you could miss so much. So, for writing, I have this, I call this prompt just writing poem as time capsule. So we're living in a little bit of a unique time. We've been through uh, different things. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm more than 50 and the last three years have been unique. So um, even if you've still been going to work regularly or doing a lot of normal things, Everything in the air is a little bit different. Figuring out what life is, is a little bit different. So I want you to spend some time thinking about the details of the past two years that have come about due to uh, the pandemic. You know, what is different? What is noteworthy? Um, things like, you know, back at the beginning when there were people singing on balconies and banging pots in New York. Uh, what are the things that changed, even if just for a few weeks, possibly for the whole two years? Um, like for me in this poem, I clearly didn't drive as much. My sleep habits changed. Um, my house was much different with everyone there constantly. Uh, um, and then what I want you to do is think of the details, um, the daily details, monthly, weekly. What are a few that stand out to you when you think of what's changed over the last couple of years? And it might be, how is the world different now? And it might just be, how are you different now? Um, positive, negative, all that. Like with my poem, I wanted to, I had been writing so many negative poems. I wanted to write uh, eight beautiful things about this last year, um, just to kind of change the script I had in my own head. Um, all right. So now, maybe you'll come up with something amazing and surprising, but if not, we've got other options there. Um, but just take five minutes and think about what's different, write about what's different. Maybe it'll come out as a poem, maybe it'll come out as a song, maybe as a story. But like I said, we're just gonna take five minutes. It might be more of a sketch than an actual piece. May or may not be done. You can finish up later and I'll but if you've been if you've been writing about these past few years, you might have something you love. You might have something you hate. Um, if you have something you hate, I think either way, what I would suggest is you type it up. And if you use a Google Calendar or some other kind of electronic calendar, type up this poem and set it ten years from now, so that ten years from now this poem pops up. 
and you can see just a, a little, I think poems for me are time capsules anyway. And this is such a noteworthy couple of years. Um, see what you see in 10 years from now, when you look back at something you wrote today, some of the details you wrote today, um, those kind of memories that we lose hold of. Because, you know, in five years from now, it'll be like, oh yeah, remember we had to wear masks? That's so weird. <laughs> does, it, does anybody have something you want to share? You got five minutes. I'll go share mine again. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for starting us off. Okay, I'm a freshman in college, if anybody gets confused here. <laughs> Coming back to the small campus, I am reminded of the cold, but also of the person I am loving to become. The first time I heard about the growing virus on campus, I didn't worry. Then the cases grew rapidly as if our team was losing, the stands of classes disappearing, reappearing masks, the fear returning to me from every cough. Although I got the shot of armor, why doesn't the pokey tiny balls go away? <laughs> I like that. You build up this fierce, terrible thing, and then at the end, it's just pokey tiny balls. <laughs> awesome. okay. Anybody else? Yeah. We'll sit this time. All right. <laughs> All good. The nights grow long and our hearts stay strong, or so we try to say. But the comforts of home, when always at home, feel ever more or less homely. The senators talk, a new president walks but they won't long remain. The youth is the future, or so they say. So take your own advice. It's us, we are, we are the faces of the future. And though we don't want to change, we will change. Can you read the first couple lines again? There's something that's good. The nights grow long and our hearts stay strong, or so we try to say. Again, then what's next? But the comforts at home when always at home. Yes, I love that. The comforts at home when always at home. It's like, yes. <laughs> it's like, that's a very, that's a really succinct way of putting a really complicated thing. That's really nicely done. Anybody else? I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I don't work at the coffee shops. I love it. Coffee tea cream and friends. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That suits pretty well right now. I wrote about tea, so <laughs> and about drinking way too much tea for two years. So. All right. Well, there's going to be a reading in half an hour, just across the way at the uh, Sandoz Center. Correct. So thanks everybody for coming. Thanks for hanging out. Uh, yeah. I appreciate it hearing your work.